Hello everyone, this is Serious Trivia. Welcome back to another episode of our Legendary Ludra campaign. We pick things up for episode 10 from turn 57 in the spring season of 194. So, as we hop back in, um, we've been pretty lucky with a lot of things um, so far. Ribu has not asked to leave, or he has just not left. Um, I have placed a lot of items on him, so if he does leave us, it would be very bad. Um, but it's already been 194, I think. If he doesn't leave now, I think it's good. Like, I don't know the exact event trigger chain for it. So it's really just going to be fingers crossed here. We could take away some of his items, just to be sure. Like, perhaps we can take it away during the end turn and then pop it back on. We can do something, because I invested, like, the garlic on him as well. But anyways, he has a very important battle for us to do first, which is rescue the Emperor. And we'll do that right away. Um, we will have to fight this one. It will be kind of silly, but there is a stack of Lound Rebels near us, and we can't really take that much damage here, so let's go. Alrighty. And we rarely fight in Shuofang, actually. The city is in the middle of a desert, uh, which is actually pretty interesting, because it has a port as well. I don't think there's a... I mean, that's a, that's a bad side for sure, but may, maybe here? I think it pretty much defaults to this corner whenever we fight one of these uh, naval fights. Uh, it's a dry summer or spring day. Our siege weapons should have a field day here. Let's just go to work. Take that out. There we go, take that out. Uh, we missed, I know. We'll hit it back again. Let's get this started to burn. Oh, wow, that's a miss too. 30, no, 100%. Don't fire the next one. Go turn around over here. There we go, that's all done. They're all burning. I don't think I care about that one. Switch ammos, punch a hole in the wall. another hole in the wall. We might just break all these. I don't think I want to burn the town either. There's no interior towers. Yeah, more than enough ammo. I might even burn that at this pace. We can put one juggernaut outside of each one. Do have plenty of ammo. Let's take care of this as well. Just in case we slip some units over there. I think... Nope. Only one shot so far. There we go. That's good. And whatever ammo we have left, let's punch this hole out. Okay, they're done. Oh no, no, you guys go go back here. Now the problem is they have these archers with a little bit of ammo. So I think what we will do is just send these boys up. Yeah, they don't have a lot of ammo. Uh, we have two burned officers here, and they don't have a commander.
gonna slow down just to make sure we're overlapping at the right places. It looks like we're a little... No, no, no. Ugh. Looks like we're a little bit behind our target. We want to be like this. can shoot up walls. That's a thing. Okay. Stop first. Stop, 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 stop. Move into position first, please. I don't mind you shooting up walls. It's okay. Oh, traps on the ground. But get into position first. Okay, they came to plug up the hole. They can do that. I don't mind that. Oh? Activate. We won't move them in, but that defeats the purpose of them moving in. We'll just kind of sandwich this corner here. Come on, we're inside. Respond to us. Trying to flank us this way? Yeah, I don't think so. Don't worry, the turtle unit's protecting them. We're sending the boss in. Don't shoot now. No. I think it's over. They're gonna lose, uh... I mean, once this unit route, they're gonna lose to, um, army loss. Hmm. It should start ticking soon. No? Yeah, it's not ticking. That's interesting. That's the last unit too. Oh no, it's starting. Uh, it's starting to tick. No, just the routing. All right, whatever. 
we do this my way. Alright, game over. Emperor is ours. Okay, he should be moved to Hene, our capital. Uh, we will move our capital to either Chang'an or Luoyang down the line. Right, we have to mediate peace for the High Empire. Now, Shufang is not a bad place. Um, they have it built a little bit weird, though. I think we'll put it as income. Actually, no. It's pretty utility, but there's a little bit of income. It's not bad. If we have extra administrator, we can definitely go down that route. Right now, corruption's not great without administrator here, but we can shift one of our administrators because we have administrators in some really bad commanderies. So who's the unlucky fellow that's going <laughs> to lose their job and get moved again? Let's see. What's our worst commandery? Well, Xihe can get better. Let's go by income. I mean, right now it's Xihe, but just because it's underdeveloped. Shangda. Wait, Lene. Okay, so we don't have that many administrators, to be fair. And if we had to move one, it's probably Shangda. But I don't want Huang Gai to be. The administrator, if you know what I mean. It's not a good administrator, especially for industry incomes like this. So we got the forge done. We could go for level 3 forge, but the problem with level 3 forge is you need to be a small regional city, so it's not that worth it. Um, I think we should come down and continue some of these. Mm, that's also tempting. Level 4 in and then level 4 state workshop. Let me get this first, or shaft mining as well. Ooh. A lot of choices here. Let me get... This can't wait. I don't have the horse pastures um, yet. So that can't wait a little bit. I think I'm going to go for the end first and then shaft mining afterward. It's just saving money at this point for shaft mining. Alright, so that cost has already been factored in. Get rid of both of these buildings. It's gonna be a private workshop and then an inn over here. We'll get that converted after that completes, I guess. I don't have to demolish this yet. It can give me a little bit of income while that waits. It's not like I can use the spot right now. Alright, and then the job for them is pretty easy. Crush the opposition, take all Dongzhuo's land. Um, I don't know if I want to hold on to what the looters keep spawning, like right here. Um, but assuming the looter is ready here, I don't think they'll spawn any new looters. And we're not currently at war with looters, so that's also fine. So we will probably take out the Leon Rebels. I mean, we want to control as much of the north as possible. Anyhow, uh, we have another army situation over here. They're just pulling back after the war in Bohai, and they have to go... Fight Ying Shao's men who has slipped across. Now the th thing is, he's between two walled cities that he cannot siege, so I don't have to, like, I can't reach him, so I don't have to worry about that. I just have to cut him off from possibly reaching our farmland here. I could just go here, perhaps? He's not gonna attack us, he's not that foolish. I'm gonna get our supplies back up. Alright, Dong has been taken over by Yellow Turbans, that's good news. Um, I'm trying to ignore this for now. I still kind of want Korn to drag Nobe into a war with us. I think what we will do is possibly land at Hula Pass, reclaim the capital, who's already level 7, so that's very nice. There is a huge military garrison here, so that's going to be difficult to take down. And then we are going to go our way into Chang'an. Hopefully the rebels can wipe out Yuan Yi. Oh yeah, and Dong Zhuo's army is coming towards us. We're ready for him. He does not have a siege weapon, so if I want him to not take this city, I would just do this. And now we have walls that buy us a turn, so if he starts sieging, we go attack him. That's probably a good rush right there. Um, this commander is probably going to be more utility. 
even though this eventually can have a little bit of commerce income, it's just not worth it in my opinion. So I think maybe just slap on Forge and be done with it. Get this to Corruption Reduction. Personnel wise, I think one guy, yeah, we're going to remove you from office, not take you away from service. Let's see how sad you are. Probably not that sad. He's, yeah, he's pretty nice in the army. He's pretty happy and he's also loyal. That means we're looking for a new administrator here. Maybe that will make this a little bit cheaper for us. I don't think we have anyone suitable. Maybe there is someone new. Unfortunately, no. Okay, so she's not a spy. Not what we're really looking for here. Also not what we're looking for here. Huh. So no no good characters for administrators 21 percent i guess we can just judge by <laughs> expertise amount at this point so bian xin would actually give us the most right they're all pretty average she oh we don't trust her I mean, some of this is because of items, right? I can flip this close and immediately she gains like seven points. She, she has good item, but really bad stuff. Okay, so I think I'm actually gonna go with her. We're just looking for some discounting here. All right, the turn we make them into administrator, they disappear from the list. So we have to go here. Not gonna swap that. I'm gonna take this from you just cause it'll give us decent amount of stat boost here. Ooh, skill tree is not that good, but we are not desperate for income here in Shuofang. We're just hoping for a slightly discounted build, so that this will work just fine. All right, out of money again. No spies. Any diplomacy moves we can make now that we have the emperor? Not piecing out with Dongzhuo just yet. I don't think we have the. The Imperial uh, yeah, like Decree option just yet. Uh, I think it'll take a few turns once you get the Emperor. And then we can maybe start convincing some other factions to do our biddings for us. Okay, I think we're good. We moved everyone. The only thing we're concerned is we're leaving. I mean, around 194 will probably when he would get his own faction, say, in a world betrayed. So... If we're trying to be really careful here, we should take away his items. Just to make sure it doesn't happen to us. Now, Dubu's horse and uh, weapon. That's the tough call here. I mean, so Huang Gai can become a really lucky man for a little bit. If Li Bu is still with us past, like, say, 197, 198, you know, around when he historically dies, then we give all the items back to him. Or else it's just too much of a loss for us. Ah, uh, he became so weak all of a sudden. But that's fine. 
Uh, Huang Gai is really strong. And uh, let's continue and see what happens. And I think with all the worrying about Lu Bu, we forgot to do our faction council. Ah, <sighs> what a mistake. They really need to prompt you. Yeah, we forgot it. Definitely my bad. Oh, fun. Let's see. Now that we're closer to Silk, uh, I still don't trust you, though. Likely you're a spy. I do want that item. Oh, they put us under siege. Well, in this case, I'm going to delegate this just to break the siege. I would like the army to stay on the field. I don't actually want to kill them all. Okay, he lost a lot of men, that delegate. And we captured Dong Zhuo. Ooh. This is a tough call. I'm going to release him. Like, there's no way we can get him, but... I don't want to just kill him just yet. More fun to fight him. I'll take replenishment here. Because he's likely to return to sieging us. Actually, no, he's not likely to return to sieging us. We kept mustering because we, we didn't move, so that's good. Yeah, we're, we're fine. He's stuck here with us while we expand on his land. That's kind of the goal here. But we had to first remove this threat. The Bu is incredibly weak. Ah, they have siege weapons. This is actually a maybe an interesting fight. Let's go. Alrighty. So they seem to have the high ground, which is usually very bad for siege weapons. But we can pull a appear behind you type of maneuver with our guerrilla deployment. So basically, we start deploy in their range, sort of in their range. Kind of risky, right? Just to take out the siege weapons, kind of expose ours. But at least we're really, really far away from the cavalry, so that's good. Um, is there anywhere else we can do this where we don't have to put ourselves in this type of situation? We could technically, like going behind, it's better for the range, but then they're still on the high ground, which I don't like. What if we go backward a little bit? But then we won't be able to hit the siege weapon from the start. There's there's pros and cons to all these things. I think what we have to do is kind of just move the trebuchet behind, or just give up on them. Both are fine options. I think there's a couple units that's not covered there. Feels like it's tilted. Okay, that's fine. I mean, worst case scenario, you can do this to protect them as well. Like, they're a little bit too wide, but like, we could send in the spearmen to let's just cover them. I don't want to get shot. We'll disappear. I will appear. I will charge directly into them. It's also raining. Maybe standard rounds. Charge, immobilize them. We have that skill. I need to do, I need to do my job. Oh, here comes their shot. They missed. 
做的还不够好。你此番是为补偿自身技巧不足。二哥 ，We made it. I'm gonna end this duel. There we go. Go here. Oh, we got shot by our own. Okay, I want to freeze this group right here. Go ahead and hit them. I will not be dueling, not with my weaponry. I will take one of the duels. I'll take you. Oh, what are you doing? I made them move. Yeah, we just kind of given up on this group. Alright, you fight as well. You're fine. Chase them. Ah, uh, Onyx Dragons. It's okay. As long as our juggernauts are fine. Alright, stick on him. Stick on him. Yeah, they're still working. So you can pick up the other duel over here. Come on. Yeah, let's grab him off. Abandon. Run. Tour up here. Go right here. We'll go take care of that. Let me mobilize them. Run in here. Okay, we're fine. Just waiting for a couple of duels to resolve. We took some damage, but we have some time to heal. It's going to take a while moving around in the northwest. Each like province take is probably, or county take is probably going to take, um, you know, two turns of walking, so... Alright, perfect timing. Got the kill here. And that's it. Yeah, Lubu is still very useful despite having almost no weapons. And um, 
Could be sad if he does leave us. Hopefully he doesn't. Alright, I'm gonna assume they're weak enough to not really bother us. And we're gonna set ourselves back onto the road. And this is our chance to get a couple of turns of healing. They went north. They're on march. Okay, we gotta clean them out first. So, who's gonna capture them? Do we need to capture them? Oh, they also have a personal instructor. I know he has honorable, which is minus 10%. Actually, fine, they both have patience, so Luger gets to lead this. Why don't we just go this way? Guess it doesn't matter. 42%, not too bad. Um, I'm just gonna delegate this. We have plenty of time to walk around as we move down south, so all the healing should be no problem. We didn't capture anyone. And we will take income. We killed him too. He didn't drop the what he didn't drop the item, but that's okay. Now we're going here. Then we're gonna hop in, land over here, and continue that way. We did upgrade all these to be able to work with tea houses. So let's upgrade all of them. Especially in our main income places. Get that upgrade first so they can start making us items. Yeah, this is fine. We are not taxing ourselves, which is okay, but we also ran out of the event. I didn't look for another one. We also have the Minister of the Han now, extra prestige point. Extra satisfaction on top of that, getting to Duke. Do we have the option to use Emperor's? Not yet. Okay. That's fine. Uh, let's continue for now. Don't draw really wants peace, but no. Oh? They suicide into us, okay. I mean, it beats having them run around, so I don't mind this at all. Ah, professional instructor. So we have a chance to create our fatigue immune army by stacking these. So let's execute her for the item. Alright, everyone's still busy fighting the south. Samala takes over. Okay, it's my East brother. Oh, how nice. You guys are becoming friends. So the idea here is we can get three of them, right, in the army. So that's 75% fatigue rate, so you don't lose fatigue. And there is... There is... Uh, where's the skill? Where's the skill? This skill, right, enables fatigue resistance for own retinue. Oh, that's only himself, though. Huh. There's no own army version of this. But then it's also available on Vanguard. So technically, we have three Vanguards. And they would all have this plus the items. And then those cavalry would be fatigue immune. That's my guess. Because there's no percentage here for fatigue resistance. It might be 50, it might be 25. But regardless, if we have 100% fatigue resistance, we basically have fatigue immunity. So... That's going to be the plan. Uh, Don't do still hanging out here. We'll let him hang out here for a little bit. I think we want our army to be full health. This is yeah, still a little bit off. Maybe one more turn. These don't need to be full, but they need to be closer to full than this. They're currently half. So we're going to wait here. He has the percentage increase. General of the left. Ah, because he was recruiting. We should swap this in case we need to recruit more in the future. Mm. Nothing really useful. Can I just remove it from him? He's no longer that unhappy, right? Because we, we shifted him quite a bit from administrator to administrator. So, yeah, 31's okay. 
not terrible. Alright, can we reach that? No, we can't, but we're just gonna go for it. There's no army. Their army's over here. Oh, looters. Look at that stack. Heavy repeating crap. These guys are no joke. These guys hurt. Although this is a joke. What is this? Okay, let's see the development down south. The rebels are strong. We mediated peace, so they're actually not fighting Han territories. That's good. We're coming over here to go there. And we're going to heal along the way. He's still pretty far away from up leveling up, right? Yep, he is. Alright, so I guess there's not much. Uh, we could think about summoning a new army. But... I would prefer to finish building up some of the places first, so I think the money is going to go to the buildings for now. That needs to upgrade. That can probably wait for shaft mining. We can probably get it next spring. Yeah, there's just a lot of buildings to do. Like this should be converted, that should be rushed a little. Maybe we rush this just to get this done, and then we can quickly do this conversion next turn, and then demolish this when we're converting, and then pop it in, and then this is mainly done. 5,000, I think we'll just hang on. And I didn't forget, we're still going to talk about books, and the book we're going to talk about is going to be all Confucian books that's remaining. And we finished up pretty much all the other books, so we're going to talk about the Book of Rights, that's going to be the first kind of Confucian book that we will talk about. And for us to unlock this book, it's going to be kind of tricky. We could have got it done very early on, but I kind of opted out of the battle, not knowing that this was a requirement. So the thing I'm thinking about is I can make kind of a frontier vassal, make them, you know, summon their army here, and then I just ambush outside their land, and then let our enemy attack us somewhere. That way we can fight with them. That's probably the plan. Uh, but Book of Rights, right, it's called... Um, Li uh, Ji in uh, Chinese, also called uh, Li Jing, or I mean, rites here, it's not ceremonies. Like, you're not thinking about rituals. It's more of etiquette, right? It's how to conduct yourself. And this book was written by Confucian students, uh, kind of after Confucian's death. And the purpose of the book is to record a lot of the debates that Confucian had and his beliefs. And this is probably the core of Confucianism, right? Confucianism talks about Ren, um, not human. That's a different character. It's uh, Ren Zipang with a R, so two. So basically, it's a relationship between two individuals or two class of peoples, almost. And that's the basis of almost entirety of Confucianism. And I think the tricky part going on about uh, moving forward with all these books is how do I talk about the books without talking about or without trying to teach Confucianism, which is something that I don't entirely know as well. And uh, you can mix, it's kind of a mix of philosophy and even culture identity because it's been cemented um, as part of the mainstream government style or ruling philosophy of Chinese governments since Han Wu Di. So when Liu Che or Han Wu Di, I think the fifth or sixth, I think fifth emperor of the Western Han Dynasty uh, was finally to push through his reforms. We talked about how he had his grandmother who was against it and his uncle, his uncle even, you know, compile the book Huainanzi, which we talked about, to talk about how good uh, Taoism is. But he wanted to push for Confucianism. And there was a Confucian scholar at the time, uh, Dong Zhong, Dong Zhong Qing, I believe, uh, who recommended to him that for the future stability or the future kind of good of the nation, it's time to abolish the hundredth school of thought. Right, we talked about how during the Warring State and Spring Autumn, you have all these different school of thought, and what they recommended at the time is that even though it's great for academic debate and for uh, growth, that you have all these different schools 
it leads to you know maybe uh, profound debates and you could from the compromise you know you come out with something greater but the argument was if you keep shifting reforms for a nation uh, the nation doesn't move forward in a sense and also it's bad for unity so for national unity uh, in terms of government's ruling philosophy during the reign of Han Wudi, the, the, the hundred school of thoughts were abolished and one school remained, and that's Confucianism. And this kind of movement kept uh, throughout the dynasties. So all the way till the imperial merit, or well, eventually during the Sui dynasty, there's going to be a merit exam for entering to government. And you take this test, and that's going to be the way you enter government from, let's say, I think, 700 AD all the way till when the Qing Dynasty finally abolished it near the end of the Qing Dynasty so like um, we're talking about like 18th 19th century right so during a span of a thousand years uh, if you wanted to be a government official in China you had to learn Confucianism so it created a great sense of national unity and also national identity and I think using nation here is probably a very loose term. I think using culture is probably a better term. I think there's like been a lot of debates, at least modern day debates, of whether uh, when China formed a national identity or it's it's basically like a cultural identity. Because you have all these different dynasties, you know, in between the Mongols came, you have the Yuan dynasty, you have the Qing dynasty, which is the Manchus. But culturally, it's still predominantly what it has always been. So despite shifting ruling, uh, not just leaders, but sometimes even different ethnicity groups, uh, the cultural identity of China remained largely the same for the last you know, 5,000 years. And part of the movement, at least in the recent part, is this movement to uh, solidify Confucianism. So whenever we start talking about these Confucian books, I think a lot of people are more confused uh, than not. It's like, what is Confucianism, right? The West... People get introduced to Confucius with like the golden rule quote, which he never said, you know, do unto it. That, that's not a quote that he said. That's just, you know, people make up quotes for those inspirational quote things. And when Confucians, I think, okay, so I think the best way to describe the whole process or all the remaining book is let's just introduce Confucian, right? So Confucius was born near here where the temple is. This temple represents his, um, I don't want to say tomb, but where he's worshipped. So his family's from here, um, in what the kingdom is called Lu. And I think that's the kingdom name that Taotian gets, I believe, because it's the same area. Uh, it's in the southern part of the Shandong Peninsula. And when he was born, he's born around, I think, 500 BC. It's ready halfway through uh, spring autumn. The Zhou dynasty was ready in steep decline. Um, the central government power is slipping. We're approaching warring states. Uh, not there yet. There are still hundreds of kingdoms. But what uh, Kongzi or Confucius realized was that as the central government is slipping, a lot of these rights or etiquettes um, are falling apart. And he had this idea that he wanted to return to the good old days, I guess, is how you want to think about it, where you still had this strong centralized government enforcing these etiquettes onto society. And the idea is relationship between two individuals, or ren. And how that works is how a son should treat a father, how a father should treat a son, how a lord should treat a subject, and how a subject treats a lord. And stuff like that, right? Interrelationship between individuals. And its purpose to create harmony in society, right? If you have all of these defined etiquette and rules or rights in this case, then you have um, a very, where is it? Yeah. Then you have a very harmonious society, right? You have harmonious family. If the kids know how to respect the parents, you know, classic uh, family, uh, the, the field purity. And then the parents also have responsibility to the kid, right? So they have to take care of the kids. So it's it's both ways. It's not saying that, you know, the kids should just, 
be good to the parents, even though that's kind of the, the mainstay. And there are statements like, you know, if your parents are still alive, you don't want to travel far away from your family. You should stay near your family, take care of them. Um, and one of the, you know, three worst thing you can do is not to have a son yourself or not have a kid yourself, I guess. But eventually it comes down to son because it passes down the family name, which is why there's this heavy imbalance between male and female, uh, even in China today. And, um, and that's why this book gives increased diplomatic relations. I think that kind of makes sense. It's just how people should treat each other in a sense. And that's the basis of Confucianism, really. And before, you know, he came down and his students end up writing this book of rights, there was Zhou Li, or the book of rights for the Zhou dynasty. And that was the system of etiquette that was breaking down. Like, let's say a lord should have how big land how much land they can hold how what type of carriage they should use like four horse carriage two horse carriage how many musical instrument they can have like there's social status defined by rules right straight up etiquette um i think even the europeans during let, late medieval period i think especially with um louis the 14th when he pushed out versailles and then had everyone live inside like you push out for etiquettes, like ceremonies. On the surface, it feels like it's kind of superficial, but once it becomes accepted, people have this cultural identity or society has an identity as whole. And things like if you have a funeral, what you should wear, like in China, you wear white and you're supposed to mourn for how many days. And all of those things are written in the Book of Right. And then there's other chapters called uh, Da Xue and Zhong Yong, which eventually became the four classic books, uh, just extract of different chapters talking about how Confucian scholars should conduct themselves uh, in terms of self-improvement. That's a very comprehensive book. Um, it's part of the five classics, and it's basically what you're supposed to study um, as a Confucian scholar. Now, before Confucianism was ever a thing, like Confucius was born, Confucianism wasn't, wasn't a thing, right? He was just a regular person. Uh, he did participate in government uh, within the kingdom of Lu. Uh, it went okay for a while. He did struggle uh, in between, basically because there was the rise of the gentry class or the, the minor lords within these small kingdoms that was starting to usurp the power of the main lord of the kingdom. So first the central government started failing and then even local kingdoms started failing when certain gentry class became more powerful than their lord and that happened in the kingdom of Lu where Confucius was. So he was bemoaning how all these um, kind of subordinates usurping or throwing coups, that's not something that he can accept because there are all these rights and rules. That's not how you're supposed to treat it. But he also realized part of the reason this was happening is because the Lord wasn't treating their subject correctly as well. So it's a it's a balance of situations. Anyways, um, it gets too complicated in essence. But the thing is, like rights or etiquettes, it's like the mainstay of Confucianism, right? How you should behave in society, how society should treat you. It's a main point. And the point that I want to hammer home is that even before Confucianism was a thing, if you were born into a gentry class and you wanted to become educated, the question is, what are you educated on? Or what was school teaching back in those days for the wealthy, for the elites? Well, for the elites, um, or if you want to become a scholar, uh, Confucius was a teacher himself. He had a school in the Kingdom of Lu as well. What he taught his students is you had to learn six things. Um, the first thing is etiquette, or li. The second thing is music, yue right um so music is like just part of the etiquette almost um it's, it's a skill obviously but also to know major songs like what song to play during what situation it's like nowadays we all know what national anthem is right that's kind of that education too and then aside from that if i can recall correctly you had to learn how to shoot a bow you had to learn how to um drive a carriage so almost like a driver's license but Beyond that, uh, there's some etiquettes to driving carriages as well. And that's why sometimes in a lot of the Confucian stories, especially when we talked about the party incident uh, way back during the fall of the Han lore series, we talked about Xun Yu's family had an uncle who, was, who felt really honored to drive the carriage for another scholar because that was kind of a chance to showcase that skill set, right? 
um, not everyone can drive a carriage. It's you know, not everyone had a carriage. It's like almost buying a car now, but everyone has a driving license. But to get a license back in the day, it's it's part of the elite education. And then beyond those four things, uh, archery, driving a carriage, um, etiquette, music. The fifth thing is calligraphy. And the sixth thing is math. Uh, there's actually a couple of math books here. Um, they don't sound like math book, but they are. Uh, let's see, where is the Book of Reckoning? A Book of Change is technically a math book. Um, and I think we did unlock Reckoning. There we go, the writings on Reckoning. This is also a math book, uh, also why it boosts commerce. So math was used for two things, uh, commerce, obviously. Another thing is fortune telling. Book of Change is a huge book on fortune telling. If we look at the yin yang symbol, or for Taoism, the, the yin yang circle, that's binary. And then if you expand that out to ba gua or the tr uh, triagrams, that's also binary system. Um, so it goes from like 2 to 4 to 8 to 64. Um, it's all based on math. And you use that to conduct fortune telling. Uh, and it links to astronomy. I mean, I think a lot of fortune telling roots does eventually lead to math. Uh, but yeah, those were the six things you had to learn. And the most important one, the first one, is etiquette. So that's Book of Right for you. And we'll talk about all the other books and expand on this confusion discussion in the future. Uh, but back to the game of hand. I think we're done with everything this turn and we can just proceed and see what Dongzhuo does over here. Oh, Lady Ding's breaking some treaties with us. Okay, we can see if we can find a new trade partner. Alrighty, I believe that trade was actually inactive already. Uh, Lady Ding obviously is the wife of Cao Song, Cao Cao's mom. Oh, Yan Bai Hu is available. Hello, my friend. Did you bring your weapons with you? He did. And a horse. And he's probably a spy. Come on, why did you have to go to Liu Biao? Huh. I have to say this is extremely awkward. I mean, knowing that he's probably a spy, we're probably still going to recruit him, use him, strip him of his weapon, and hopefully he blows his cover or something like that, so that we can keep him. I mean, yeah, we're definitely grabbing him. Hmm. Anyways, uh, Dongzhuo is trying to slip through. I mean, the longer he stays on the field here, the worse it is for him. So I don't know why. Like, I wouldn't even stop him. Go ahead, keep walking. Let's see. For this group of units, he's the administrator, so we'll pick up this. And then we also want patience, obviously. Okay, nothing's really going on here. We'll take one more turn of healing and then we'll start sailing away. Let me change up his gear before I forget. I mean, he's still incredibly useful. And I think we can probably put him to some use here. Hmm. Don't like him, huh? It's okay. We can change it up. So I think for this army setup, we can just put him in the army. With maybe a few of our other uniques and have them come down and help our main army out so they can all get a little bit of level. This is actually not a bad army setup if we have this in the future. That way he also doesn't get any more, you know... Uh, so... If we do want to flip him, which we do, we would like him to be very happy with us. So, who do we not care about? Cao Ren, I think have dutiful... Yeah, so he's not going to feel too bad if he's not in that position. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure how he'll feel about getting fired, though.
doesn't feel too good about it, but but not too bad either. Minus 12, so the 20 will go away, right? He'll be at 38. It, it's acceptable. Uh, it's a glitch. It, it will work. There we go. We technically want him closer to 100. And I believe spies cost as much as their salary cost in the new faction. So if we just like increase his salary like crazy, then I'm thinking Duba has to pay this much too. <laughs> 750. I mean, I'm just trying to boost him to 100 so that he will start taking down the turns to betray Liu Biao. And then he'll basically tell us that he's a spy and then he will stay with us. That's that's the hope here. Oh, so the trick is I can't enter the waterways until here. So I would just hang out here until they break through Hula Gate because I can't enter the water here. I have to walk all the way over here. That's too far. I could walk all the way over here. You'll be fine. Do we want to chase them? I mean, I think we want to follow them. I don't, I don't think... I, actually... Forty-six percent chance of capturing. You are very good at this. Only six percent for him, though. I do want Yu Jin's weapon. Which we can only get by capturing. Oh, let's just delegate this. I think they're gonna go back, and then they'll be summoned again. Oh, they, he dropped the weapon. Ah, uh, we caught him again. Go back home until next time. Alright, we'll be taking this as well. I'm not scared of that army. We'll delegate this. Alright, we got ourselves an animal tamer, which will spawn us horses periodically. I want this to be as highly upgraded as possible, as soon as possible. Yeah, not worry about this force. And then I think we'll go salt into this. And then probably go to war with Yuan Yi. Oh wow, this is really glitched. Here we go. Do we have any deals with him right now? No. Okay, perfect. So we can definitely go to war with him. No one wants to trade with us. I think eventually we might have to make another vassal. Oh, Ingtra wants peace. Yeah, let's do it. I don't actually want to fight them. I don't want that land. It's hard to, it's kind of awkward for us to defend it. Like we can't expand down or up. So we might as well just don't touch it for now. Um, we'll give you one food. I don't expect them to be ready. Oh my god. Any chance you're hoarding? Oh no. It's a never thing. Ne negative 100. Just, just give me everything you have. All right. Well, Fangjie, show it. Huh, the Naman tribes. Alright, this way Koron's still at war with us, but he's kind of isolated. He has to travel through a lot of awkward land. Oh, he also has a piece of land here. But we're, we're going to go to Dongzhuo here. Hopefully they take this. Anyways. I don't think we want anyone else. I think we'll spend the money on buildings. Huh. 
Godong can definitely go tall, so I think we will. We'll go small regional. Pop in. Questionable what our fifth building will be. I think land development is actually a really good choice. Just for the extra base, even though it can only go to level 3. And a little bit of food as well. And then for the sixth building, depends on where we want to make the capital. I think the capital is probably not... I mean, there's also peasantry base on this all the way to here. Mm, so we're different for our mandate of heaven. Uh, we'll debate about this when we get there. It's not a urgent issue right now. I'm gonna rush this. We're missing entrepreneurs, we need a level 4 marketplace, which will happen once we get Hodun upgraded. Over here, we can get this conversion going, destroy this, build ourselves an inn. That's perfectly fine. Let's continue here. Alrighty. Nothing much happened here. So, aside from, you know, missing out our faction council. At the beginning of spring, this year has been pretty good. We got Yen Baihu, who is most likely a spy, but we're going to keep him 100 and see what happens. We'll pay for him to become turned if he indeed is a spy. Because I can't wipe out Obel's faction anytime soon. What's has there? Wow. We definitely need to get a, a spy slot uh, somehow. It doesn't have to be through um, uh, fatigue, uh, prestige points. We can just, you know, branch out over here and get us at least one spy slot just to take a look at things. So that's another option for us. Anyways, things are looking pretty good. I think we'll end our episode here. Um, we resolve the issue. Well, Coron doesn't count. He's just a minor issue. We're going to start launching our attack against Hulao Gate. Uh, why do they have to be in the river? I mean, I could... Get into the water here, I guess. He's level 8, that's good. We'll be sailing down as well. I think we'll be going to war with Yuan Yi with this new army. They have to clean up a couple of looters. Grab the rest of these. We'll join down here. We're probably going to go to war with Fight. them eventually. Right now we currently have a trade deal, which is nice. But that's not going to last too long. Especially after we wrap up most of this. What happened here? Wow, we didn't pay attention to the map. I mean, things has been kind of random. So I think he went over there to fight um, the Leon rebels, which, you know, when he was part of the Empire, he sent an army out there, but he's just successful at that. He split in between two pieces here. There's still plenty of high Empire territory around. Liu Yan, our adopted son, is doing well here. So we'll basically merge into him. Maybe we'll vassalize and uh, annex him so he returns to us, or we just wipe him out. Both are decent options. And then once we start boarding the Naman tribe, things might become a little bit more awkward. Okay, Liu is very small. Maybe we can just wipe him out. Like, once we start taking Loya, we can maybe build another army to start going down south. But there's a lot of minor factions that we can just wipe out. Because if we wipe them out, then the spy doesn't... it's not an issue anymore. But anyways, uh, that's the plan. Uh, we also should probably do something about Obey. Maybe he'll be friends forever, but... I don't know if I can trust this student of ours. Anyways, see you guys next time. Bye!